Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work, the show that delves into the municipal stories that are making the headlines across Canada. Today, we're taking the show to the nation's capital to chat with Alberta Senator Paula Simons about the role municipalities play in Confederation. But before we do that, we have big stories to dive into. And unlike question period, Ian has promised to actually answer the questions I posed to him. So Ian, first few days of June, how are you? I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Uh... <laughs> It's uh, well. It's June. What June third? As we're recording, it'll be June something. As we uh, as we uh, publish this, uh, June started out okay. It's a little bit wet, but it's busy. It's conference season. I think I said that last time. As we're recording, it's CAMA week and FCM week. The last week I was at a couple of conferences too, and yeah, it's uh, it's a busy. All my folks are somewhere. Hey, that's all that matters. They're somewhere and they're doing business. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. So let's dive into the big stories that are making the news. We're going to start off here in Alberta, where some residents of Slave Lake, Alberta, are feeling unsafe amid a growing number of crimes that they say stem from the town's homeless shelter and neighboring encampment. Councillors voted to suspend homeless shelter, the homeless shelter operations on May 22nd and remain closed until November 1st. The 24-hour shelter near the town's fire hall opened last November, but began year-round operations this April. Now, the town previously offered a MAT program from November to April to give people experiencing homelessness a safe and warm place to sleep during the winter months. The press secretary for seniors, community and social services, Minister Jason Nixon in Alberta, told Global News the province allocated $900,000 for Slave Lake to run the shelter year round. Quote, given city council's decision that the shelter may shelter be closed effective May 22nd, the funding provided by the province will need to be reevaluated for the duration of the closure, said the press secretary emailed to Global News. Ian. My first question before we continue on with the story is, how important is it for municipalities to consider the impact on decisions that they make, particularly when grants and fundings are involved from different levels of governments? And that's a good way to open it. Um, so if we ignore the specifics of the issue here for the moment, just talk about the financial aspects, it's quite important. Municipalities have very few uh, funding sources. They've got property taxes, they've got fees and charges, and then they've got transfers from other orders of government, but this would, of course, be one of them. So if they don't, uh, if the money doesn't come in, then, of course, either the municipality is left holding the entire cost or some proportion of the cost that maybe somebody else isn't funding. Or they choose not to do something. And, of course, there are political implications of both of those choices. So it's quite a significant, uh, it's quite a significant impact. And it also runs uh, in alignment with the values that maybe the municipal council has set for itself. That are we accepting money here for something that is aligned with our values or maybe something that's not aligned with our values. So there, there's certainly some impact there too, Chris. Can the province or federal government ask for money back from municipalities? I know that's a stupid question to ask, but it's an important one because if you are applying for a grant, you get said grant for a project that is supposed to run 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and then a month into that project, you go, it's not working out, so we're going to close up. Does the province have an ability, or even the federal government potentially, to step in and say, well, if you're not going to do what the grant is you applied for the grant for, we're asking for the potentially $900,000 back. Yeah, absolutely. As long as there's some sort of a written agreement, my suspicion is that that sort of a clause would be written into any uh, financial agreement in much the same way as if you borrowed money from a financial institution and didn't use it for what it was intended to be, they could call the loan back. Um, it's not like the premier puts their hand into their pocket, pulls out a few million dollar bills and hands them over. There's always some sort of um, a reconciliation to be done at the end of the day. And this this is no different to that. So no, it, I, I don't think the province is offside with making that uh, making that request. So now let's go back to the original story and let's go from yeah. the social aspect of the story. And now the mayor of Slave Lake, Francesca War, in a social media post, said that council has asked town administration to facilitate transportation for homeless clients to receive support outside of town. Staff will also look at hiring a security company to enhance nighttime patrols in the area around the encampment and also throughout the downtown core, which was a major concern that residents had brought up in this story. So the, the, the social question then becomes, 
when municipalities shut down a homelessness shelter, it can be a double-edged sword because you're supposed to be supporting people and you shut that down, where are they going to go? Town of Slave Lake is basically telling them that we're going to send them to other communities to get help. Where do municipalities need to strike a balance in helping the less, the vulnerable, I should say, and community safety? Is it a delicate balance? No, it's always a delicate balance, Chris. In this case, it's a social issue, of course, but it's primary housing is one that's primarily provincial or federal in terms of its area of responsibility, but it ends up cascading to the municipalities just because of informal downloading. It wasn't anybody's formal decision to say that the municipality is going to have to deal with housing, but if nobody else does, then the municipality ends up with it. And it is something that affects local people. So local governments have an interest in that. And even to the point where getting rid of shelters is a, whether it's just like this for a few months or whether it's in a, on a permanent basis, it doesn't solve the problem. Even moving people to the next town or city doesn't solve the problem. The biggest problems we're seeing here are health or social or maybe related to employment. And if we don't solve those problems, it means the homelessness is going to continue, whether it's in this particular municipality, the one down the road, anywhere across the country, or whether it becomes invisible. And now we start to see people in homeless uh, encampments or couch surfing. Any of those sorts of things begin to happen just because you've put the squeeze on in a municipality, particular municipality, which means it's going to pop up someplace else. And it runs the risk of getting more and more dangerous as these encampments become less and less formalized. About five years ago, I would say that this story would have been able to be transposed this story and put it into Edmonton. In my research and in my talking to municipal leaders that I've done, I'm hearing this type of story in smaller rural communities, the homelessness problem, the drug and addiction problem in smaller communities and smaller urban rural communities. And I say that respectively, don't have the resources to potentially adequately fund these potential problems and find out solutions for them. How do municipalities pass the buck? And I say that knowing that I know what the answer is already going to be without trying to pass the buck because municipalities only have a limited supply of money. Mm -hmm. The federal and provincial governments, this is their jurisdiction that they have to deal with, but the municipalities are stuff, stuck left holding the proverbial bag here and trying to find a solution. Can the municipality just say, the province needs to step in and actually come to the table a little bit more than just giving us a check. They need to actually send adequate support, whether it be social work or even security and more police officers, more RCMP, or are the municipalities stuck holding the bag? Well, first of all, I've avoided using the name of the municipality, Slade Lake, but it doesn't matter because the topic exists, to your point, in many, if not most, municipalities across the country. So it's something that is that is systemic in nature. And as such, it doesn't really matter where it is. And it, there's nowhere for municipal governments to download to. There, there have been provincial officials who have said, you know what, this is kind of the role that maybe the charitable sector or the faith sector should be taking on. But in reality, you can't download to those because they're not an order of government. So it's either the it's either the municipalities deal with it, they ignore it, in which case it still exists, or other orders of government, there's only one taxpayer, other orders of government decide that they all need to be part of the solution rather than just handing off the problem to somebody else. So it's 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 not an easily solved issue and it's not gonna be solved by putting band-aids on the symptoms. And the band-aids are things like homeless shelters, right? Or whether they are year round or whether they are not, it still doesn't address the reason why these people are looking for suitable housing. Now I'm going to be the first to admit that I'm probably going to get the name of the community wrong here for the next story. So I apologize already to the great community of Quesno. And I apologize, Ian, is that the right? No. How do you no, pronounce Quinnell. it? Quinnell. Okay, there no. we go. Yeah. Quinnell, British Columbia mayor is asking the BC Supreme Court for a judicial review of his city council's resolution to censure and sanction him over a controversial book on residential schools, including stripping him of his travel and lobbying budgets. Mayor Ron Paul calls the resolutions unreasonable. He's asking that a judge declare that the city breached its duty of procedural fairness owed to him at the April council meeting where the resolutions were passed. 
Paul's lawsuit argues council breached its duty of fairness owed to Paul because it was ambushing him at a council meeting that council had orchestrated into a public meeting into allegations about him and his wife regarding the book without notice to him. Quote, the proposed motion were not included in the agenda for that meeting. End quote. The petition states council failed to give him, quote, adequate notice and an opportunity to respond to the allegations. It goes on. The petition comes after the councillors voted unanimously to censure Paul, saying his actions related to a book that denies the harms of Canada's residential school system have jeopardized the city's relationship with Indigenous communities. Councillor Scott Elliott had made the motion saying that the all the work that had been done to rebrand the city had been demolished by Paul's actions. Now, a report to council alleged Paul attempted to distribute a copy of the book titled Grave Error, How the Media Misled Us and the Truth About Residential Schools at a Caribou Regional District Board Meeting. Now, the mayor has apologized for picking the wrong book to bring to that regional district meeting in nearby Williams Lake, saying it, he didn't mean any harm. Ian. Now, we have said on the show, the actions of one can often change the narrative around an entire community. And we've talked about that in the past in many situations. But I want to talk about the procedural process here, particularly in British Columbia. Does the mayor have a leg to stand on when talking about the procedural motions council needed to work through to address their concerns about the mayor's actions? Maybe. To me, this is, <laughs> this is fat. For, the mayor said, uh, used the word uh, ambush, I think, as part yeah. of his, uh, his statement. I don't see how this is an ambush. I live a province away and I knew this was going on. Um, so the fact that the mayor was ambushed by this, I don't know that that holds a whole lot of water. This, like the last story, is a bit of a, um, it's fascinating because it's a microcosm of what's happening in local governments in far too many places across country. This is Quinnell, but it could just as easily be somewhere in Eastern Canada or the Atlantic or somewhere in Northern Canada. It doesn't make a whit of difference. The specifics, of course, are, are changing. But in, this is a case where, I mean, procedural fairness is critical and it's becoming more and more important. And if the mayor is correct that he wasn't provided with procedural fairness, then he has a point. That's probably where the idea of the judicial review comes in. I think it's kind of difficult to defend some of the things that he is trying to defend. Um, you, residential schools in this case, and the topic, of course, that led to the sanction is secondary. It's a very important topic. However, um, we've we've seen more and more people, uh, whether they're members of council or whether they're mayors or like chief elected officials, saying rather than accepting, admitting the error and accepting the, the time out in this case, where the, the budgets have been removed, the people some of these people are pushing back hard. And we're seeing more judicial reviews and they're becoming more common. So things like codes of ethics, codes of conduct are increasingly important. And it's not only important to have these things, it's important to use them as well, which appears to have been the case here. And the mayor is suggesting, to me anyway, one of the things I often talk about in, when I talk about governance is CEO versus CEO, which is where the chief elected official, in this case a mayor, has taken on the chief executive officer role. And they, he has, in this case, has also had some of those those uh, privileges, if you like, removed by council. He has no more authority than the rest of council, but sometimes the mayors don't know that or they don't inter internalize it or they don't accept it. So there are lots of issues here. Understandable. And for our last story, we're gonna head out to the Mayor Times. Ahead of this fall's municipal elections, Nova Scotia is launching three campaign schools to help encourage more people to run for office. The sessions are open to everyone, according to Minister Will Affairs Minister John Lohr, but the province is hoping to encourage people to un of, from underrepresented groups like women and people from diverse backgrounds to attend as well. Schools are set for Sydney, Turo, and Shelburne in Nova Scotia later on in June. Participants will be able to have the cost of childcare reimbursed after the sessions. Halifax Regional Municipal uh, Councillor Lisa Blackburn said she's a proud graduate of the previous campaign school. Prior to running in her first election in 2016, Blackburn attended a school hosted by the Nova Scotia Status of Women. She said it gave her added confidence before launching her campaign. Quote, I think this is an incredible opportunity for people to learn exactly what is involved in with running campaigns, she said to CBC. Ian, now you have probably run 
or you have probably taken part of these campaigns before through strategic steps. Why is it important to head back to school or to these campaign schools prior to entering into public life? Well, the basics is to understand what the job is. When we we do a lot of these uh, on behalf of either municipalities or regions, and sometimes with groups like Chambers of Commerce, which is kind of an interesting sponsor. Um, and we've been discussions across the country for this, and it's typically and obviously in the year of an election, depending on nomination periods and things like that. But the, I think they're really helpful because they do talk about what the job really is versus what people think it is. And so two things in an ideal world, two things can happen. One is those people who are kind of getting involved for the right reason, they've been grown up in their community and they want to take the next step. It, they, it kind of assured that the job that they're looking at is the one they actually thought it was going to be and the role is what they thought it was going to be. On the other hand, we it's not uncommon for us to encounter people who don't really know what the job is or who are one issue people or who are disturbed about something that doesn't even fall within local government's authority. Immigration is a good example of that. And ideally it dissuades those people. Now, attending these schools isn't mandatory anywhere. Heck, in, in ter- getting oriented after the fact isn't mandatory in most places, but I do think it's a good practice. And so one of the little oddities we've seen about these is if they are virtual and if several of them are being offered, like is the case here in Nova Scotia, we have seen people from one part of the province attend the school in the other part of the province so that their local people don't know that they're running or kicking the tires. And it's just it's a, just a little quirk of this. We've had really good reviews uh, from people who've subsequently gotten elected that have gone through these schools to say it was a real eye opener that people now are going into the role, really understanding not only what it is, but the time commitment that they have and the pressure that gets put onto their families as well. So all around in this case, I think these candidate schools or we call them uh, candidate workshops are uh, are ideal. Um, They certainly can't be mandatory, wish they could, but I think they're a really good idea. How important is it for a campaign school like this, whether it be run through the province or even through strategic steps, hypothetically, to bring in uh, someone who has that municipal experience in that community? Because you're right, there's probably someone who's going to be from uh, uh, the south end of Nova Scotia who's going to be attending the central part because they don't they don't want to tip their hand too quickly because they want to see. But they might hear from someone in, say, the RM, HM, H. RM of, uh, and they might say, you might think it's only a 10 hour a week job where you're reading a report and attending council meeting, but it's a lot more. How is it, how important is it to actually get those hands-on experience? Because hands-on experience, and and I'm going to sort of use the colloquial term here, books is not the same thing because you can teach someone through a book, but having someone there in person who has lived experience is probably quite important for these type of workshops to succeed. Whenever whenever we do it, we will try and get either a former elected official or at least somebody who's not running in the next election to be there as a sounding board to talk about the reality of the situation. That sure the rules say you only have to show up to like four meetings a month. The reality of the situation is extremely different, particularly if you want to be really good at what you do as a really good uh, local responsive local elected official. Having those people there with that lived experience is very important. Well, hopefully everyone who's been listening for the last 15, 20 minutes has realized that unlike Ottawa, Ian did answer my questions during question period. So I appreciate that. And we'll be right back after a quick break with Senator Paula Simons. Welcome to the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Alberta Senator Paula Simons. Senator Simons has been at the forefront of an important Senate inquiry into the role and place of municipalities in our Confederation. In December of 2021, Senator Simons launched a formal Senate inquiry to address the numerous challenges, opportunities, and constraints faced by Canada's municipalities, both large and small. Now, according to the Senator, our cities and towns are at the front lines of many critical issues, yet they are often lack the necessary funding and political power to effectively manage the responsibilities that have been increasingly downloaded upon them. 
This year, she, along with some of her Senate colleagues, have held a series of roundtable discussions to address the important issues facing our municipalities, including infrastructure funding, emergency preparedness, and social issues. With that, Senator, welcome to the show. Very happy to be here. So, Senator, I want to start off with a simple but a very complex question for you, and it's at the heart of what the inquiry is about. In your opinion, where do municipalities fit into our confederation today? Very uncomfortably. I mean, they are technically creatures of the provincial government. So, you know, if you think back to 1867, when, you know, the biggest cities in Canada were Toronto, Montreal, but they were tiny compared to what they are now, the premise was that cities are not included in the rubric of the constitution, that they fall under the jurisdiction of provinces. The challenge we see is that, first of all, we have cities now that are larger in population than many of our provinces, and yet they have no commensurate power. So you've got a really big city like, you know, Metro Toronto, Metro Montreal, Metro Vancouver, uh, to a lesser extent, Calgary and Edmonton have a larger population than New Brunswick or Nova Scotia or Prince Edward Island or Newfoundland. And yet those small provinces have all the constitutional power that any province does while the cities are left dangling. The other problem is that cities are dealing with far more complex issues than they did in 1867. And even small municipalities are on the front lines of responding to everything from uh, you know, emergencies created by climate change to uh, integration of new Canadians to dealing with all the hard work of reconciliation. And they just don't have the taxing powers, the resources to do that work. And as we can see, particularly those of us from Alberta can see that when uh, the federal government attempts to sort of catapult over the provincial layer to give resources more directly to municipalities, provinces tend to take that rather badly. Well, thanks, Senator. Um, you have also got a unique perspective in that you are looking across the country, whereas in the individual provinces, of course, they're looking inward as well, but only at the various provinces and territories. Are you seeing similar issues across the country, um, whether large and small, like you've made a reference to in terms of uh, metro areas? or urban and rural um, topics that you're running into? Oh, absolutely. And this is, of course, one of the great strengths of the Senate is that we are a national body and it's part of our responsibility as senators to represent our regions. And so uh, of the 12 senators, uh, apart from myself, who took part in this inquiry, they came from right across the country, uh, from, you know, from small towns in Ontario that are, you know, from pre-Confederation to, uh, you know, I had a senator from Twillingate, Newfoundland, who took part, and one who comes from uh, the Acadian region of New Brunswick. And so they gave speeches in English and French. The other thing that was really special is that we have a number of former mayors in the Senate. So uh, inquiry speeches came from people such as Eric Forêt, who's the former mayor of Rimouski, Quebec, and uh, Bernadette Clément, who's the former mayor of Cornwall, Ontario. And we had uh, a speech from uh, Brent Cotter, who was the former uh, deputy minister of municipal affairs for the province of Saskatchewan. So we had people who had really expert knowledge. And then we had also people uh, who spoke from the heart and from their communities. And I should say, well, I was lucky to have another Albertan, uh, Karen Sorensen, who's the former mayor of Banff, who took a, a, an avid part of the inquiry and talked about the unique challenges of leading a municipality that is within a national park within a province. So uh, so everyone's perspective was different and informed by the issues in his or her community, but there was a real common thread, which was the frustration that municipalities feel when they can see the goal, they can see where they wanna go, and they know, practically speaking, as the people doing the most frontline politics, what they need to get there, mm -hmm. but all kinds of levels of inertia and rice bowl guarding get in the way. Good. Well, thank you. When it comes to the what you have found out or discovered, how much of it is structural versus the way municipalities are structured in the country rather than things that are cultural or be well, it's hard to tease those apart because the structure is a function of the culture and the culture is a, structure of the, is a function of the structure. 
So, I mean, there are structural problems, but there are also real cultural problems. And there are, you know, issues of territoriality. I mean, for for people in Alberta, especially those uh, who are municipal leaders themselves, they will know full well that the Smith government has just tabled, you know, a series of bills in the legislature, uh, which would dramatically hamstring the ability of municipalities to work directly with the federal government. Uh, it'll be interesting to see when there's a change of government in Ottawa, as there inevitably will be, um, if the province will change its tune when there's a different federal government. But, you know, it's been a workaround that people have been utilizing for years now to have you know, infrastructure funds and revitalization funds and other things that the federal government has set up, particularly to do with housing uh, and, and LRT construction and that kind of thing, to get federal dollars to municipalities. But as long as the provinces are fighting with the federal government, as seems to have been the pattern since 1867, um, it's really difficult because the municipalities, you know, I think I had a line in one of my speeches that they're like the children sitting at the, you know, at the kids table at Christmas. And now mommy and daddy are fighting at the big table and the municipality sitting at the kids table are like, Oh, mommy and daddy are fighting again. And all we really want is dinner. Federation of Canadian municipalities will be meeting this week, literally the day after this episode airs um, in Calgary for four days to talk about national advocacy that goes on in Ottawa during your last few years since you launched this inquiry in 2021, meeting with stakeholders, I'm assuming, is probably a key priority for yourself and yes. even for your Senate colleagues. <laughs> Our confederation is, is as diverse as the people in it. The, the issues that are affecting Newfoundland and Labrador are not the issues that are affecting BC. And I, I could tell you that from speaking to municipal leaders you have probably heard a range. Are there any silver linings that you've heard over the last few years about what's going on municipally right now? You talk about how our municipalities are sort of squished right now at the top of the show, but is there any silver linings about what municipalities oh, yeah. are facing right now? Because I think, you know, it's when you're, it's when you're stressed sometimes that you do your best work. Uh, municipalities have had to be inventive. They've had to figure out workarounds. They've had to figure out how to best leverage their political and social capital. And I think municipalities have done some amazing things that maybe they wouldn't have had such creative responses if they'd had simpler, more linear solutions available to them. So, yeah, I mean, I think you can see all around the country um, cities innovating in different ways, whether that's in infill housing projects or, you know, that missing middle piece that people talk about so often, whether it's about um, uh, reconciliation. And I think you can look to Edmonton as an extraordinary example of, you know, over the the times that, you know, from Stephen Mandel to Don Iveson to uh, Amarjeet Sohi, um, reconciliation in Edmonton has has come leaps and bounds in terms of building a community that is inclusive of, of indigenous people. Uh, but I wanna come back to something you said, Chris, about the problems being different. It's funny how much the problems are the same. One of the people who took part in our roundtable discussions uh, is the mayor of Moncton. Moncton, you may not know this, I did not know this, is the fastest growing city in Canada. It's having an extraordinary influx of immigrants, including Francophone immigrants from Sub-Saharan Africa, who are totally changing the makeup of the community. So, you know, you, we may not think of Moncton as a multicultural uh, hub, but it's really become one. And so there are things Moncton can learn from, you know, from Toronto, from Vancouver. But, you know, there are other communities. Brooks, Alberta is one of the most multicultural communities in the country. So the challenges that Brooks has faced, you know, Moncton can learn from them too. So the, the other really common chord was the issue of climate change and the wear and tear on public infrastructure brought by climate change. And this is happening whether, um, you know, whether you're the mayor of Norman Wells 
or uh, uh, a city councilor in uh, Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, right? I mean, all of all of our communities, large and small, are facing extraordinary challenges relating to how we build infrastructure that is resilient, whether that's dikes in the Chinecto Isthmus or, uh, you know, on, on the BC coast, or whether it's uh, flood mitigation measures in Calgary or dealing with the effects of forest fires. And so, yeah, I mean, that problem looks different in different places, but the root of the problem is the same. Thanks. My last question for you, Senator, then, you have talked about the relationship between federal and provincial governments and local governments as being an evolutionary one. What do you see on the horizon? <laughs> well, I mean, I think nothing nothing focuses the mind quite like a crisis. Right. Um, and, you know, we have these sort of slow burning, we have the slow burning crisis of homelessness, which is different than the slow burning crisis of lack of affordable housing for, you know, people with you know, working people with middle class incomes who also can't afford to buy houses. Uh, we have the slow burning crisis of, you know, the opiate epidemic and, you know, drug use on our streets. But we also have things that are coming for us related to climate change. And I think that I think people are going to be forced to act pragmatically, not because of the better angels of their nature, but because they're going to have very little other choice. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because we've talked a lot about my work on the municipalities inquiry. I'm also a member of the transport and communication committee, and we're just completing, we're just putting the finishing touches now on a study on transportation infrastructure and its resiliency in the face of climate change. And, you know, when you hear about something like the Chinecto Isthmus, which connects Nova Scotia to New Brunswick, and is in very real danger of sinking into the sea. And in the meantime, you know, the provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and the federal government are having this sort of, you know, fight over who should be paying for what. And you just want to say, stop it. Fix this problem. The, the people of Canada who rely on the isthmus, and that's pretty much anybody who wants goods out of the port of Halifax, uh, we don't care which of you fixes it or whose jurisdiction it is. You just have to get it done. And, you know, my great fear is that we might actually have a calamity that is our wake up call. I would like us to wake up just as we perceive the calamity on the horizon so we can do something to stop it. Thanks. In, in your conversations with municipal leaders and even conversations that I've had and Ian's had working with municipalities across Canada, I get a sense that municipalities want to be heard, but no one's talking Absolutely. to them. No Absolutely. one's actually asking, sitting down with them. It's often, I, I'm often shocked when I get a response from municipal leaders to come on this show, to come on my other show, to say, yes, I'll come on. I want to talk about issues. In your conversations with municipal leaders, do you get a sense that people are just fed up with the partisanship? And I hate to ask the yeah. political question to end this year, but I'm going to, uh, Senator Simons. Do you oh, get a I sense think that, so. go ahead. Yeah. Because municipalities have to solve problems every day. Every day, they have to fix the thing. You know, if your garbage didn't get picked up, if your road, you know, has a sinkhole in it, right? They don't have time to sit around and have a philosophical discussion. They got to fix the thing. And so I can only imagine how frustrated they are when they see some of, you know, what happens in Ottawa where everything takes a long time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I guess... To circle back to where we started, one of the things that started me down this road was at the beginning of the pandemic. I was stuck in my house in Edmonton and I felt so helpless. You know, the country was facing this extraordinary crisis and what was I doing? And at the time, there were no government MPs from Alberta. And so I started calling mayors all across the province the mayor of Grand Prairie, the mayor of Drayton Valley, the mayor of Innisfail, the mayor, you know, I, I called mayors up and down Alberta and said, you know, what are your challenges? What do you need? How could I help you to be heard? And in a lot of ways, I mean, some sometimes what came out of those phone calls was actually a practical solution to a problem. Uh, that was where I first spoke to Karen Sorensen, you know, the mayor of Banff and the mayor of Jasper, when I spoke to them said, we have a crisis, we have to pay federal 
rent to the federal government and we don't have any income because we're vacation communities and nobody's coming on vacation. And so I, you know, I spoke to the ministry and I think I helped in a small way, at least to get them some, some relief on that rent. But in other cases, I think the mayors I spoke to were just so happy that somebody wanted to talk to them and hear them out and, you know, and offer to be um, a vessel for their ideas to get to Ottawa. Um, it was, it was something I did in that moment as much for myself, honestly, as, as to be useful, just so that I could have a sense that I was doing something. Um, but it kind of worked. And I think that was, you know, I hadn't thought about it till just now, but I think that's also one of the inspirations for this inquiry was just talking to so many mayors who were solving the problems of the pandemic in their communities every day without, you know, time for ideological brouhaha. They just had to get the job done. Senator, I want to thank you so much from both Ian and myself for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule in Ottawa to sit down and do that, this this conversation and this interview, but also this inquiry. Municipalities are at a precipice right now, and as uh, they gather in, FC, uh, in Calgary for FCM, I can imagine this discussion that we just had is probably going to be on a lot of people's minds and a lot of people's conversations there. So thank you so much. I just want to take a moment and say the links to the three round tables, two in English, one in French, are in the show notes the link to senator simons's website which is the senate website and also the youtube channel is in the show notes as well so thank you so much for sitting down with us today yes, thank you chris and thank you ian Another great interview, another great episode wrapped in. Uh, it's always great to have different people from different stakeholders from different parts of this country come on the show to talk about municipal issues. Paula Simons, Senator Simons, sorry, seems like a wealth of knowledge and she's doing great work in the Senate, isn't she? Yeah, I think she really is. When I she had been appointed years ago now, of course, I mean, she would have been a, 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 like a well-known journalist. I thought that she was a, she was an inspired appointment. And Certainly, some of the things that she was talking about certainly show that and show some of the independence that she's exhibiting. And I think that that's really great. So I'm looking forward to seeing where they go next. So as this episode is all about Canada, Canada's kind of on the national stage municipally right now. Uh, we have FCM coming up it, literally the day after this airs from June 6th to June 9th. And that's where municipal leaders from across Canada are descending upon Calgary to talk about municipal issues. I'm going to be there. Hopefully Ian's going to be able to come down for a day or so to potentially uh, meet with some local leaders. So hopefully we'll be able to be there together and say hi to people. If you see us, come say AI. But there's another organization you talked about at the top of the show. Uh, just tell us a little bit more about what CAMA is and what they do. Yeah, Can CAMA, Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators. I expect many of the people who are watching actually are aware of them. They're having their uh, annual conference the uh, the early part of this week, and it's in Banff, and it will be several hundred municipal administrators from across the country getting together. We're happy to be one of the major sponsors of that. And um, we're learning a lot about some of the current issues that are facing municipal administrators, what to do about them. Uh, of course, we're seeing a lot of turnover in these major, in these administrators. And, uh, it's, we're really fortunate to get to, to work with them. There are a lot of people we've worked with and we know at the at these at CAMA conference. And so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, just a reminder that the links to Senator Simons' three roundtables that she had with municipal leaders are in the show notes. If you're listening to this, scroll down. They'll be in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, they're in the show notes as well. Ian, it's always a pleasure, and we'll see you back in two weeks' time for another great episode. Can't wait to figure out where we're going next. Thanks, Chris. Talk to you later. <laughs>